everyone, and welcome back to What's Left of the Left. I have a couple announcements before I start this episode. So, first of all, I gained like 17, 20 new followers on Spotify in the past week. So, that's been cool. So, if this is your first time listening, welcome, and I'm very happy to have you. Um, second of all, I've been working to try to figure out how to make the audio sound better. So, hopefully, this is better and not so like crazy and like you know oversaturated sound if that makes sense um uh third thing my dad listened to the gender episode where i talked about using gendered words and stuff in like random contexts that don't need them and i closed off that episode by saying bye guys thank you for listening so i thought that was kind of funny so i'm gonna try to not use gendered language on here even though you know guy is kind of a gender neutral term at this point but yeah and then third thing before i start the episode fourth thing before i start the episode sorry i don't want this episode to bring up some like unwarranted misogyny in people because i will be talking about makeup and the cosmetic industry and stuff like that and i really don't want this to people to think this like justifies unwarranted misogyny because it's not at all that and if you come into this episode with some like purity culture vibe or whatever or like try to take a purity context out of this that wasn't there just don't so i just want to say that before i start the episode because i think that i think whenever anyone's critiquing mainstream feminism or feminism generally and like makeup and stuff like that i think a lot of people who are like not on the left sometimes think it's oh it's an opportunity for no so yeah thank you so much for being here and i hope you enjoy the episode my research and ideas on this are purely a critique of western society and the united states specifically This is in no way related to makeup use of indigenous peoples or cultures outside of America that were not influenced by America today. This is also an analysis of mainstream makeup trends, not non-mainstream makeup trends. The need for makeup comes from Western beauty standards and are ultimately rooted in white supremacy and their use in America. From when America was established to roughly the late 19th century, makeup was largely taboo and not something that the patriarchy enabled. American colonizers didn't see the perfect woman as being stunningly beautiful or abnormally beautiful, but plain and reserved. This might lead into the notion that makeup could be liberating for women and a future cosmetic revolution where women could be bold would be a real revolutionary act, but that's also not true. During the beginning of the 20th century, makeup to enhance features was still frowned upon and largely only used by stage actors and sex workers. Then comes World War I. Men went off to war, leaving women bored and curious. Many people connect makeup to war in the sense that when men left, the women felt a sense of liberation from the patriarchy, leading to the development of celebrating femininity. But is it really that simple? As usual, the answer is no. As women were having to take over jobs during the war that men had usually done, non-deployed men and the patriarchy patriarchy saw this as sort of a masculinization of the feminine. On top of that, propaganda efforts were rampantly showing beautiful, scandalous women. This was an effort to urge men to go to war, because fighting in a war was the best way to show you were the quintessential American man, and because of that, you would get the most quintessential American woman. Due to the new boost of masculinization of both men and women, cosmetic capitalism prevailed. Massive marketing efforts for face creams, face masks, powder, hair products, and more simple efforts of femininity were rampant in America during the First World War. This was largely accepted as a sort of feminine liberation, when in reality it was the effect of the patriarchy and capitalism. Helena Rubinstein was a popular cosmetic figure at the time, and would urge women to be more beautiful, and would say things like, quote, Even if your social or professional life does not demand it, your patriotism demands that you keep your face bright and attractive so that you radiate optimism. Unquote. This is intrinsically woven into America's rise to fame during World War I. 
Post-World War I, America became an imperialist powerhouse. The image of America was manufactured to be perfectly powerful in any way possible. The American white woman was one of the defining characters that made America during this time. The Roaring Twenties brought the new feminization to a new level. There was an excess of wealth, excitement, and the idea that you needed to live your life to the fullest. This brought extravagant displays of white supremacist beauty standards, and at this point, a little bit of makeup was the norm, at least. Fast forward through World War II, where the new American woman was famous and a war essential, especially in the Cold War. During the Cold War, many campaigns against the Soviet Union, obviously, came out and were extremely popular. One example of this is the kitchen debate, a propaganda effort showing all the fruits of capitalist wealth and comparing that to a poor Soviet kitchen. This type of manufactured juxtaposition was also used to compare American versus Russian women. So for example, in the kitchen debate, politicians would show an American kitchen that had all of this stuff, toasters, microwaves, ovens, you know, pots and pans, all that kind of stuff. And then it would show, you know, a fake Soviet kitchen that had like nothing in it. And it just showed the wonders of capitalism and how communism is so oppressive or socialism. So they would apply that logic and they would do the same thing to show American versus Russian women. And Russian women were often depicted as working, ugly women who didn't take care of themselves. And the American women were depicted as white, wealthy, stay-at-home mothers wearing makeup and jewelry and looking extravagant. This was also seen in the comparison of white and non-white, specifically black women in America, throughout all of America's history. When you analyze the actual history of makeup in America, it's clear and obviously linked to imperialism and white supremacy through war. This new perfect woman was manufactured as a tool during globalization to further American cultural imperialism around the world. Outline eyes, red lips, and cheeks were not a product of celebrating femininity, but an act of political violence that used white American women as canvases for propaganda. From then on, the cosmetic industry was set. The makeup standards were set. As anyone can establish, makeup trends change all the time. There's a million makeup trends going on right now, going in and out, in and out of style. And even though there have been and are so many makeup options, most of them still cater to the manufactured American women. Mainstream makeup trends feed into the idea of American femininity. First, boldening the eyes, then a complementary lip color, and changing her face shape to be unnaturally beautiful. Many feminists claim that makeup is liberating. Being able to express yourself however you want is key to mainstream feminist rhetoric, but is it really liberating? I think the cosmetic industry will always make you think so. One of the main arguments that feminists use is that it makes you more confident, which is absolutely true. If you're following and conforming to beauty standards, you will definitely feel more confident because you're closer to the oppressive forces that made you feel insecure in the first place. Because you will be gaining power by like submitting to these beauty standards and all of a sudden you know, you're know you going up and up, up and up on the ladder. So of course you're going to feel more confident through that. And even though many of these trends are rooted in white supremacy, many and most makeup trends were started from, quote, scandalous women. These women consist of black, indigenous, poor, trans women, and sex workers. Often the blueprint of makeup trends these days were frowned upon and rejected in mainstream white culture. The main reason these trends were found upon in their origins is because of their origins, not the actual trend itself. Once white women appropriate a culture or steal a trend and white men approve of it or find them attractive doing it, it deepens the idea of the perfect American woman and it makes the perfect American woman like more have more depth and more layers because all beauty trends of white women in the past 100 or so years were made by white men it's not the cultural norm for white women to make them for themselves and in the spirit of white supremacy and colonialism they often just steal them instead okay (laughs) hot take but Disclaimer, 
Yes, white American women make fashion and cosmetic trends. I know, I know that's real. Like, I know that happens. But most of the time, when a white woman makes a trend popular or creates her own, it's often inspired by previously oppressed ideas of marginalized femininity. So those marginalized groups, those oppressed groups, those frowned upon, whatever, a lot of the time, you know, these new creative ideas that, like, if white women come up with them, like, and I know what this isn't all, it doesn't always happen, but it does happen, and it happens a lot. Okay, continuing. Um, because of this, makeup is also linked to cultural colonization, and the better known term for this that most people know, I think, is culture vulture, and it's not, you know, it's pretty deep, like, it's not just like a, oh, funny, no. So even then, once women are adding new makeup trends to mainstream American culture, it's still rooted in white supremacy and no way liberating of the patriarchy. So even though these trends and these like cosmetic and makeup trends are getting accepted into mainstream culture, most of the time they're still rooted in oppressive forces. Even if it's not, and it also is the patriarchy, and even if it's not the patriarchy like being like, you know, this is the new makeup, or this is the new beauty standard, whatever. Like, white supremacy and the patriarchy and colonialism, like, they're all smushed together and they're all linked together. So you can't deny the fact that, like, this is not liberating for women. And there's a lot of nuance to this issue that I haven't touched on yet. I think there's a lot of ways for makeup to be liberating. And I think that makeup can, is and can be used as an art form for expressing your identity, culture, background, your person, etc. And in no way am I saying that's a bad thing. I think expressing yourself should be celebrated and using makeup as a tool to do that is amazing. And many makeup artists on the internet use their faces and bodies as canvases to make art. And I think that's so much different from mainstream beauty efforts that are shown with makeup. It is literally just face paint at a certain point. So if you're using yourself as a canvas, I think that's a lot different. And it's just not what I'm talking about. And I think that people often like when others are critiquing the cosmetic industry or mainstream beauty standards and stuff like that, that have to do with like makeup and, you know, some feminists are like, it's liberating because, you know, so-and-so, you know, paints a galaxy on their face like yeah that's art that's great but like that's not ad that's not even relevant I don't know I also want to touch on the fact that people should not be ashamed for wearing makeup from little things like mascara to a full face of makeup whether you're trying to fit in be more beautiful impress someone use yourself as a canvas whatever we all live in this world we have to work and exist, and there are lines to the harm you can do, but existing in capitalism is always harmful to one person or another. Again, there are always lines to this, and it's not an excuse to be a bad person, but we do have to exist every day, and using makeup as a way to exist nicer is not good, but it's not something anyone should feel shame for. Like, I don't want anyone to listen to this and be like, oh, am I, like, feeding into patriarchal western beauty standards like you can't not like if you completely remove yourself and try to completely reject these beauty standards that are pushed on women and feminine people like it, you won't be able to exist and so I don't want anyone to feel shame like I'm just trying to give background on this issue with critiquing feminism and stuff like that. So, in conclusion, makeup and its mainstream use is not a tool of liberation, and nor is it undermining the patriarchy. Too often, feminists get wrapped up in the idea that if it makes you feel good, it's good for the cause. And that's simply not true in this case, and most cases. All right, that is it for today's episode. Thank you so much for listening. And you, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, there's a link tree in the description of this. 
you can click on that you can find this podcast's instagram twitter email and other listening sources if you are curious so yeah you can follow us on follow me on instagram at what's left of the left on twitter at wlotl or you can email what's left the left at gmail.com if you want to hear any specific topics from me or recommend anything i'd love to get your feedback as well so thank you so much and have a good rest of your day people <laughs>